Well, here we are again, everyone. This is going to be a quick rundown on ethical relativism. Uh, you got a chapter from James Rachel's about this that covers some of the same content in a little bit more depth. This is a position that you may never have heard of. It may never have occurred to you that someone could view ethics this way, but it can also be kind of common in certain among certain uh, demographics of the population. So we need to talk about it. Um, also need to explain what's wrong with this view and why we will generally be assuming that it's false throughout the remainder of the term. So here's what ethical relativism means. It's the thesis that all moral truths are dependent on other people's beliefs and feelings about them. Or to think of it another way, they're relative to individual or cultural societal commitments. So if you're an ethical relativist, then the statement, you know, well, that's just like your opinion. That is basically being applied to uh, moral claims. And the idea is that there's really not any objective basis on which moral claims are being made. They just boil down to how you feel about them or what society has generally accepted as being acceptable. The most common form, which is the main focus of James Rachel's uh, book chapter is cultural relativism and this is the view that what whether or not what you do is morally right or morally wrong hinges entirely on what the ideals of society are so if you live in a society where the death penalty is an acceptable form of punishment then the death penalty is okay if you live in a society that has viewed the death penalty as impermissible and outlawed it then the death penalty is not okay. And this can be generalized on this view to pretty much any practice. Uh, so if you live in a society where polygamy is widely practiced, then polygamy is perfectly fine in that society. If you live in a society where polygamy is generally frowned upon, which I think ours would qualify, then polygamy is generally wrong. So you can see how if you adopt this sort of view, you're not going to ultimately have any foundation, objective foundation, on which you're rejecting a moral principle. So you're not saying, you know, the death penalty is, is say, morally wrong because it's uh, too extreme of a punishment or because it's not any more effective in deterring crime than life in prison. Uh, those would be attempts to make, like, to provide sort of more objective moral criteria for why you would be opposing the death penalty. Instead, you'd just be saying, like, well, you know, 10 years ago, the courts said that the death penalty was an impermissible form of punishment. So it's an impermissible form of punishment around here. Uh, so it's a very different, very different kind of rationale than what we'll often be looking at as, as we move forward in the course. Now, why is this view appealing to some people? Why would you adopt a position like this? Well, generally it stems from a couple of basic observations about moral discourse. One is, it looks like people just wildly disagree about moral truths. It seems like different societies, both contemporarily and also historically, have had uh, a lot of disagreement about what proper ethical conduct is. And the thought about relativism is, oh, well, this gives us an explanation, right? Maybe maybe the explanation for this widespread moral disagreement among societies is that uh, morality is just dependent on what society believes to be correct about a certain practice. Another reason why relativism can look appealing is that the view seems friendly to cultural tolerance. So a relativist looking at um, different practices in another culture, the thought goes like, oh, well, for those people, that practice is permissible. But for me and for people of my culture, it's not permissible. And so the thought is that relativism kind of cultivates a live and let live attitude, which some people find appealing. And lastly, relativism is appealing because it acknowledges that no one group has a monopoly on moral truth. So it's, it seems to acknowledge that um, you know, different groups can come to different conclusions about what morally acceptable behavior is. And that 
no um, no one singular entity is the sole definitive source of um, of what what's ultimately right and wrong. Now here's an argument that James Rachel spends a lot of time on. He spends a lot of time talking about this argument from disagreement in the reading. It's an important argument and we need to understand where it goes wrong. So here's an example of this kind of, of this style of reasoning applied to a controversial hypothesis in the scientific community. So you've only got one premise to this argument, which is the first statement. The second statement is the conclusion. Here's the premise. There's a lot of disagreement among scientists about whether string theory is true. And then the conclusion, there must not be a fact of the matter about whether string theory is true. So the question is, the, the first claim is definitely a true statement. There is disagreement among scientists about the truth of string theory and how it should best be understood and what its implications are and so on. So the question is, are you justified in going from the first claim, the premise, to the conclusion? Are you justified in making that inference? And most people, I suspect, will say no with, with regard to this particular argument. They'll say, no, I mean, scientists haven't figured it out yet. They may not know yet whether string theory is true, but there is a fact of the matter as to whether or not string theory is true. There is an objective uh, fact, or in this case, non-fact, about the truth of string theory. Either that's the correct view of the universe and how it's structured, or it's the, an incorrect view about the universe and how it's structured, and that's the end of the story. So it's just a matter of figuring out whether that, whether that uh, theory holds, you know, holds up to scrutiny over time. So that, in, in other words, if you want to think about it in the locution of earlier stuff in the course, this is an invalid argument. You are not justified. You, you can easily accept the truth of the conclusion and still have ground, or excuse me, the truth of the premise of the first claim, number one, um, and still reject the truth of the second claim. You can think that the premise is true, and in fact it is true, but you can think that the conclusion is nevertheless false. There is a fact of the matter as to whether or not string theory is true. So it's an invalid argument as stated. So here's a different argument. S same structure. It's about abortion, though. There's a lot of disagreement among philosophers about when, if ever, it's morally permissible to perform an abortion. So there must not be a fact of the matter about whether abortion is morally permissible. And the question is, is this argument any better from the standpoint of its reasoning than the previous argument? And I think the answer is no, and Rachel thinks the same thing. You cannot make the inference from disagreement about a subject matter to suddenly throwing out all possibility of an objective fact of the matter. Now, it is true that abortion is the, the moral controversy surrounding abortion is a different kind of disagreement than the scientific disagreement that we mentioned on the previous page. But even if we're limiting ourselves to morality, to, as our domain of discourse, there are other examples where there was once disagreement among people about the moral permissibility of a certain practice. You know, there was a time in human history, several, it's not that long ago, seven, eight generations ago in the United States, but you go back in time a few centuries, and basically um, it was a live moral controversy as to whether race based slavery was morally permissible. And as far as I'm concerned, there's now a pretty widespread consensus that that practice is fundamentally unethical and that having a social policy of that nature based on uh, racial identifiers is unacceptably arbitrary and, and egregiously unfair. So that seems to be a case where un unless, you know, all societies as, as they've who have rejected slavery as they've like progressed and become more modernized and more pluralistic and so on, unless every single one of those societies has somehow made the same wrong move in their moral reasoning, that looks like a case where some moral progress has been made and there is a fact of the matter about race-based slavery and about its moral permissibility. And the fact of the matter is that that practice is wrong. 
So even if we're limiting ourselves to just talking about morality, it looks like there are cases historically where there's been disagreement about a certain subject and over time uh, a consensus has emerged and it looks like it's been on the basis of some kind of observation tied to an important moral value, whether it's fairness or equality uh, or respect for persons or whatever. So I think, no, this, this argument really doesn't look like it's any better, at least structurally, um, than the one we had on the previous slide, which was about disagreement on string theory. So you're not going to be able to go, logically speaking, from the observation that there's disagreement about a topic to then going to the, to the conclusion, oh, well, because of that disagreement, there must be no fact of the matter regarding this particular topic. That inference is not going to work. Here's another thing that's interesting about ethical relativism that you may not notice. Ethical relativism actually can't support tolerating opposing points of view, at least not in the way that, it's, that it appears on first glance. The reason for this is that you have examples in human history of cultures and societies where uh, the established norm in those societies is actually to be intolerant of other people's moral views. And in some cases, not just their moral views, but perhaps their, uh, their actual identities as people, their, their races, genders, nationalities, etc. Um, and when you have a society where you've got this social norm of intolerance, then for that society, by relativism's own logic, intolerance becomes the morally correct viewpoint right because again relativism says what's right and wrong is determined by your back by the background culture in which you live so you live in an intolerant culture now suddenly in intolerance is what's actually uh required of you and so the only way you can defend an attitude of tolerance toward others is to defend the claim that such an attitude has an objective moral basis right um, perhaps grounded in a certain kind of like moral humility or um, a, not, you know, the, uh, maybe a virtuous character trait of, of being open-minded or, or non-judgmental toward others. But those are going to be objective criteria. Those are going to be criteria that you think hold independent of what society you live in. So paradoxically, if you really want to defend tolerance as, a, as an idealistic and, and uh, worthwhile you know, outlook on morality you have to defend it as an objective fact about the moral universe. You have to reject ethical relativism to be able to get that argument off the ground. Another point that Rachel's makes is that the cultural differences that we perceive, which often kind of motivate people to go, to, go toward a relativistic worldview, aren't typically as deep as they appear. Uh, he spends some time with one example he talks about Eskimos uh, and their the historical case of when they sometimes commit infanticide. And uh, some people, you know, you might interpret that as being an example of them valuing human life, you know, especially young human lives, differently than we do in contemporary society. But when you actually unearth their reasons for why they practiced it, it was only done in times of extreme scarcity, and it was done specifically to try to essentially it was a form of triage you know you didn't have enough reese you didn't always have enough resources especially during the harsh winter months to feed all the people that were present and so tough choices had to be made as to what lives would be um what human lives would be continued and which ones would not in a sense and uh this was kind of a this was a practice that was designed to help make those tough decisions and he thinks that when we unearth the real values that are in play the Eskimos didn't really value human life any differently than um, than we do nowadays it's just that they were facing some really difficult choices because of uh, where they lived in the world and and what their how, how they acquired um, food and whatnot he also points out that societies, regardless of where they are located, have to endorse certain general moral principles to be able to endure. 
and this is not a complete list of what those principles are. There's some overlap here with uh, Russ Schaefer Lando's ethical starting points that you might notice. But he points out, you know, every society is going to have to have some norms of truth telling, some prohibitions on theft and murder. Uh, you're going to have to have norms where you actually value caring for children and procreating. If you don't have those kinds of sort of basic norms at some level, then your society is just going to break down. If you don't have prohibitions on theft and murder, you're just going to very quickly have anarchy. Everyone's going to fear for their lives and their property. That's not going to be a sustainable society in which people can live. If you don't have binding contracts and norms tied to truth telling, no one's going to, you know, communication is going to break down. Nobody's going to be able to trust one another's words. You're not going to be able to have signed and enforceable contracts. Uh, and no one's going to trust anybody else. And if you don't have some kind of norm for caring for children, uh, children are going to die or otherwise suffer severely before they ever come to mature reproductive age. And if you don't have people getting to mature reproductive age, then you're not going to be able to perpetuate your population in any way. So these seem like moral norms that have an objective basis, right? They have to be present in order for human societies to prosper uh, or even really to just persist over a long period of time. And the other, the other big one that Rachel mentions is that there is a general convergence on what we might call mid-level moral values. We've already covered some of these in our ethical starting points. Um, when I say mid-level moral values, I'm referring to certain, you know, some of these are like virtuous character traits, like honesty, generosity, empathy, kindness, loyalty, etc. But some of them also have are, are also more more akin to kind of basic moral principles. Like um, if you think back to the list of ethical starting points, like deliberately harming others requires justification, or equals ought to be treated equally. Those are more like um, closer to just instead of just being like you know, character traits or basic value statements, those are closer to being, you know, actual moral principles. But uh, these kinds of things have been converged upon by an awful lot of human societies over time, um, especially nowadays. And I've, I've already mentioned in a previous lecture, you know, a couple of those ethical starting points, like um, the, pursuit of, the pursuit and promotion of equality uh, have played a huge role in a number of social movements in the last 150, 200 years. So you're probably getting the kind of pattern here, picking out problems with, with ethical relativism and trying to show that the view's really not as appealing as some people think it is. But I, there's, there's still more on this to bring up. Um, one major problem is that According to relativism, you know, your background culture determines what, your, what the correct moral beliefs are. On that view, it is not possible for a group to be mistaken about its moral beliefs, right? The assumption is that all societies have, their, have the correct set of moral beliefs for them. And that's extremely odd because we have all kinds of historical examples where societies have had widespread beliefs about things that they just turned out to be totally false uh, about. And... For some reason, relativism does not allow that to be possible in the moral domain. Very strange um, implication there. The other, uh, the other weird thing is that according to relativism, there can't be any moral progress because you, you know, if you live in a society where, I mean, just think about, uh, you know, the United States. Think about like early twentieth century, right? We were living in a society with. Uh, the Jim Crow laws on the books and women didn't yet have the right to vote, uh, you'd have to basically be committed to the view that that version of America was no morally worse than our current society where the Jim, Jim Crow laws are not on the books anymore. Um, that's not to say that there aren't still some laws that have carried on that legacy in certain ways, but those original laws... Um, have uh, have largely been have largely been repealed, and women do have the right to vote. There have also been a lot of other like social improvements, I would say, in America during that time, during that 120 year stretch. Um, 
but you would have to basically say American society right now is no morally better or worse than it was in 1920 or 1820 um, or even 1720 before we were even an independent society. And that's a hard pill to swallow. It is, it is difficult to, I think it's difficult to make sense of the idea that there have been no moral improvements in any society in the world uh, over the last several centuries. I think there's been a lot of moral, uh, moral progress. But if you're a relativist and you just say, well, you know, whatever the norms in society are, those are the correct moral norms for that group of people, then, you know, what a society's moral norms are, since that's always the right view of ethics, there can't be any moral progress. The, the changes that are made don't, don't correspond to making the society better or more ethical because the society was ethical before and now the standards have changed, but those are still just, you know, since the standards are relative to that society, uh, it's not an improvement. It's just different. But that just seems wrong. It seems like sometimes improvements are made. And the last one, and this is, uh, this is probably the final deal breaker for a lot of people, when you've got societies that are engaged in what looks like mass wrongdoing, um, you can't condemn it if it's an established social norm. So uh, the most obvious example is you're going to have a hard time on a relativistic worldview condemning Nazism in Germany in the early 1940s because that was an established norm of that society it was endorsed by uh, the people in power now there were there were some people who resisted of course in germany there were some people who were not in favor of the nazi regime and did things like harboring uh harboring um jewish refugees and, and people like that who were trying to avoid the concentration camps but in germany as a whole in society of course on relativism's view those people were actually those people who were you know hiding jews from the nazis were actually if they were in germany were actually acting wrongly which is if there are any truths in ethics, surely those people were acting, were acting permissibly in trying to resist the Nazi regime and trying to save the lives of those people. Uh, so this is, uh, this is, I think, this last point is, if, if nothing, if, if nothing else so far has convinced you that relativism is going wrong, this I think is the, the knockdown argument. Uh, if you, if you're really gonna swallow, bite the bullet with relativism, you're gonna have to basically say, yeah, well, you know the. Um, the widespread wrongdoings in societies like Nazi Germany, as long as those are established norms in those societies, that was morally right for them to do. I can't, I can't do that. I can't say that uh, about those things. And I hope that uh, you all feel similarly about those kinds of practices. Like those practices were objectively wrong, uh, regardless of what the established norms in that society happen to be. Okay, so I don't want to close on basically just tearing down relativism completely, and that's not how Rachel closes out the chapter. So the question is, what can we learn from ethical relativism? What, what are some lessons to take away from this view of ethics, even if it's not the right view of ethics, and even if it's one that we're ultimately you know, going to reject as we move forward in the course? What are some lessons to take away from, from that worldview? One is we should be a little bit wary of assuming that every view we have in ethics is based on an absolute rational standard. Um, some of our views will be based on personal idiosyncrasies, emotional reactions, um, unreflective intuitions. So we, we should be wary of assuming that, you know, everything and, and I should also mention some of those things maybe we are all you know affected in various ways by the societies in which we grew up um, so we should be wary of how those things can affect our judgments and not just assume that all of our moral preferences are based on on rational thinking we should also not be too hasty in passing judgments on others until we have evaluated the reasons that underpin their positions. And that's uh, it's a very important lesson to learn and one that we'll be trying to learn throughout the whole semester with all these different moral issues that'll be under discussion. Um, we always wanna give our 
opponents a fair say. That doesn't mean that we will always be convinced by the reasons that they provide that their view's right, but we at least need to give them a chance to have their say and not just hastily pass judgment on them that they're they're stupid or ignorant or uh, or haven't haven't thought things through as much as we have. And the last and maybe most important lesson I think to take away is that mere disgust or repugnance with a cultural practice, that's not a good reason by itself to condemn the practice as morally wrong. And I think that this is the observation that makes people associate relativism with tolerance, is they think like, well, if you're a relativist, then you're, you know, you're not going to just reject uh, the practices of a culture because it makes you feel uneasy. You're going to, you know, have a more, more of a live and let live attitude. Well, you can have that attitude without being a relativist. And in fact, as I mentioned in a previous slide, being a relativist is actually sometimes not going to be consistent with having that attitude. You know, if you live in a society where certain kinds of um, prejudice and intolerance is the norm. So, but it is important to recognize that just because we don't understand or we're not comfortable with a cultural practice, they might have good reasons for what they're doing. And again, like the previous bullet point, we should hear them out and we shouldn't be too hasty in condemning um, a particular practice until we've, until we've evaluated the reasons that those people give for doing what they do. So as we move forward in this class, we're going to adopt a perspective known as ethical objectivism. This is the opposite of relativism. It's the claim that ethical truths are independent of others' beliefs about them. That means that people can be wrong about whether they think, uh, excuse me, people can be wrong about whether or not particular um, moral claims are true or false. So it means that you could say performance enhancing drugs should remain illegal uh, in professional sports. And it could turn out that when we investigate the objective moral fact of the matter is that they there's no good reason to have them remain illegal and they should be legalized. In that case, it would turn out that you were wrong about you know, your moral beliefs about that one issue. However, just because it's possible to be wrong about moral truths does not mean we're gonna eliminate all moral disagreement. One of our assumptions in our course is going to be that reasonable disagreement about ethical issues is not just possible, but often going to be inevitable because the questions are really, really hard and Harkening back to um, one of the very first lectures in the course, you know, philosophy is not the same as science. It's it's not this is not something where we can just run a run an experiment or conduct a survey to get the right answers. We've got to engage in some reasoning about very abstract subject matter. It's not always going to be easy to get even a group of people who are trying to who are sincerely motivated to try to find the right answer. It's going to be hard to get convergence about um, some of these some of these ethical issues and those are the two those are the two big big takeaways moving forward from relativism so relativism does have some things to offer some lessons to learn but it is a perspective we are ultimately going to reject um, and we're going to try to use these these tools of analytical reasoning and, and argumentation to figure out what the objectively correct answers to moral questions are as we move forward in the class. It is not going to be easy, but that is the goal uh, moving forward. So um, you got an exam coming up this week where we're gonna you know, hopefully fine tune some of your knowledge about how to use these tools. And then we're gonna try to keep building up that skill set as the semester goes along. And then hopefully towards the end of the class, you'll be in position to write a, a substantive paper about an issue of your own choosing where you'll try to make, you know, an argument based on objective moral principles that lead to some kind of conclusion about the right thing to do with respect to one of the issues we've covered in the class. So that's the long term trajectory and how this all kind of fits together. Uh, we'll I'll, I'll see you in the next lecture and we'll, you know, we'll keep trying to make progress toward that long term.